Trying to find a way to get away Don't wanna listen to what other people say Cause they don't know what I've been going through today Right in the madness, you see my sadness Take all my pain and exchange it for gladness It be so tragic, those who don't have it Your love is everything I'll ever need But lately I ain't been sleeping well through the night And sometimes I don't know if I wake up alive And right in the madness, you see my sadness Take all my pain and exchange it for gladness It be so tragic, those who don't have it Your love is everything I'll ever need The whole story, the big picture on the box of jigsaw puzzle pieces, the picture of how God loves us, is laid out plain enough in Jesus, who now lives in you. It's the story of a beloved who became the lover. For God so loved the world. Now you do it. Love your sister. Love your brother. Love your neighbor. Love your spouse. God loves you. Christ shows you how love works. Now you love. Let's stand up all over the room. We've come to worship Jesus. All authority in heaven and on earth is His. Every word He speaks.
silence and cower at his roar. For if my God is for me, then what have I to fear? For nothing will deny him the glory. All the glory is yours. Well, every now breathe
Silent dad. 
recall things that I find as though they always were. You alone can do this. New mercies you have brought in love upon the My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. 
But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the Righteous One. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. We know that we have come to know Him if we keep His commands. Whoever says, I know Him, but does not do what He commands is a liar, and the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys His word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we are in Him. Whoever claims to live in Him must live as Jesus did. Good evening. Welcome. Week three campus community. If you have your Bibles, get them out. Turn to First John chapter two. Shout out to the porch, by the way, getting here tonight. Locked and loaded early. The royal family in the house. I saw your sons. Hey, question for you uh, before we dive into First John. Has anyone in here ever read C.S. Lewis's book, The Pilgrim's Regress? Yeah, it's not. It's a bit of his less common works of Lewis. Uh, one of the very first books he wrote after his uh, conversion. Um, if you're not familiar with it, it's a retelling of sorts, as Lewis put it, of John Bunyan's famous Pilgrim's Progress, except set in uh, the sort of modern and ph philosophical landscape that Lewis was accustomed to. And the story um, is about a man named John, right? an ode to John Bunyan. It's a story of a man named John, um, who, uh, who, who is born and lives in a land called Puritania. And the um, character of God in the allegory is known, by, um, is known as the Landlord, capital L Landlord, and he owns all the land. And there's some other characters called the Stewards, and the Stewards um, are the overseers of the Landlord's land. So for the sake of the allegory, they're, they're representative of pastors or, or ministers. And so John, main character, is this young man who has a lot of questions about the landlord. Who is this guy? So his parents send him to meet a steward to get his religious education. And so John goes to meet a steward, um, and it turns out to be this really great guy, this really friendly, warm guy. They have this really great conversation about life and uh, a common interest they have in fishing and cycling. Um, and it's all going really well towards, until the end of the conversation when the steward goes, all right, um, enough with that. Let's talk about the landlord. That's what you came here to do. So he goes in the corner. He grabs this mask. It's this ghoulish, scary-looking mask. He puts it on. And then in a very stern voice, he says, the landlord owns all the land. And he is very, very, very kind. We all love the landlord and we're so grateful for him. But, and at this point he goes over into the corner and he grabs this card and he hands it to John and he says, this is the list of rules that the landlord says you must not do. John looks at the list and realizes, goodness, half of these things, he doesn't even know what they are, and, and some of them he's, he's done that day. So the steward goes, um, better fess up if you have, um, and if you don't, or you keep on doing these things, well, the landlord is liable to throw you in a black hole with scorpions. But remember, he's very, very kind. And we're so grateful to the landlord. Where John leaves this conversation with the steward, thinking, what's up with the bipolar landlord? Like, why can't this, whoever that is, why can't he just leave me alone to live my life? And so, no surprise, John decides, man, I don't want anything to do with the landlord. And so he leaves the land, he leaves Puritania, and he goes off in search of the island of his desire. Now, why do I share that story? Because when it comes to the question of sin and obedience, which our passage tonight is all about, it's my conviction uh, that many of us, whether we realize it or not, bring to that kind of question a perspective often on sin and obedience that can feel a little bit like the, land, like the steward. And here's what I mean by that. On one hand, 
we sing about, trust, see in scripture God as a good and loving father who invites us into his home. But then there's this other side, right, where it feels like at times, man, he runs a tight house. And there's all these sort of rules. And the way that we sort of typically justify it theologically, the question of, well, how, 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 can, how can the first one be true and also the second one be true? How can there be a good and loving father and also like be liable to, I don't know, cast me into hell? Um, the way that we sort of justify it theologically is, is oftentimes something like, um, well, God is loving, but he's also holy. And so what we do is we sort of, whether we realize it or not, we sort of separate out the love of God from the holiness of God and we almost put them in tension with one another, sort of like a good cop, bad cop routine. And if you have that perspective and you come to a passage like this one tonight, 1 John chapter 2, the first six verses, you will read a lot of this like it's a threat. You will read a lot of it as if it's the steward talking to you, the bad steward from Pilgrim's Regress. Let me show you what I mean. Uh, verse 1 says, of chapter 2 says, My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But can't you hear the steward talking? My dear children, I'm writing to you so that you better not sin. Right? But then we keep reading, and look who shows up right after that. Sort of the good cop. But if anybody does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Let's go. Then we go, yeah, you had me a little nervous there in the first sentence, John, but that, that makes a little bit more sense to me right until you get to verse 3, when look who shows back up. We know that we have come to know this one who has atoned for our sins if we obey his commands. Come on, John, which one is it, right? We start to get a little hot under the collar. Well, my goal tonight is to end with a sort of rereading of 1 John 2, 1 through 6, and try to show you that John didn't intend for us to read this as like this back and forth emotional pull. Well, one verse, it's like really assuring. Praise God, he's, he's, he's atoned for my sins. And then the next verse feels like, but you better do what he has to say. Like, which one is it? There's a different way to read that, the way that I think John intended to read it. But to get there, we first have to understand what it means to obey God. What does that mean? Because if our perspective is like the bad steward, then what we will do is just presume that obedience to God is simply compliance with his arbitrary house rules. And then we'll define sin as simply non-compliance with the house rules. And the house rules are just God's arbitrary way that he would prefer that we live. But that's not the right way to think about obedience. I want to try to show you a different way. That obedience is not the cost that you have to pay in order for God to love me. Nor does God have arbitrary rules. Rather, a better definition, well, let's just try this one on, that obedience is best defined as man living in accordance with how God created him. In other words, there is not life and then the rules that you're supposed to follow. There's just life. And then there's, there's just life and that life can only be lived in accordance with its created design. Let me explain it to you like this. Think about a fish for a second. How does a fish live in accordance with how it was created to live, by swimming, right? Fish live in the water. So it's not a stretch to say that water is the rule of life for a fish. And obedience to its rule of life is it does what it's created to do. And if a fish were to jump out of the water and onto 
a dock or a boat, then that fish will have violated its rule of life. Well, likewise, friends, there is no life for a human being outside of God. That's the mistake we make when we separate out, like the steward in Lewis, life and obedience. Many of us like to think there's, there's just life, right? And then there is the way that God would prefer you to live that life and we'll call that obedience. And that's what you should do because if you do, he'll reward you at the end. But then there's other people who live their life a different way and they just live it on their own terms. And that's what you shouldn't do because that would be disobedience. And if you do that, then you would be punished in the end. But that's not actually a true alternative. The statement, I wish God would just leave me alone to live my life, is as nonsensical as if a fish were to say, I wish you would just leave me alone to live on the dock. There's no life on the dock. See, what Adam and Eve did in the garden and what we have done ever since in our own sin is not simply choose a different way to live. Adam and Eve didn't choose a different way to live. They chose death. They jumped out of the water in which they were created to live on the dock. And what happens when a fish jumps out of the water and onto the dock? It dies. The punishment for that is death. This, um, this illustration of fish in the water is not unique to me. Uh, there's many teachers over the years um, in the church that have used it. In fact, um, I, found a I found this illustration from the early church, Tertullian, in say the year 200, preached a sermon. And this is what he said in it. He said, but we Little fishes, after the example of our Lord Jesus Christ, are born in the water. Nor have we safety in any other way than by permanently abiding in water, so that most monstrous creature, he's talking about the devil, who had no right to teach even sound doctrine, knew full well how to kill the little fishes by taking them away from the water. If a fish is taken from the water, it dies. But let's just stretch out our illustration a little bit. Because it doesn't die immediately, right? It sort of flops around on the dock for a few moments right, before it expires. And that's probably a better way to understand the nature of sin. Think how different of a take that is than just non-compliance with house rules. You and I were created to live forever by a God who created us in his love by his love, for his love, and instead we have jumped out of the water onto the dock of our own self-determination. And what is all of human life now compared to that than simply the fleeting gas for air on the dock sustained by our own pride? That's the nature of sin. That's the position that all of us find ourselves in. Fleeting gas for air. Because if you think about it, if you were created to live forever, what is 70 years but just the flop of a fish on the dock in comparison? You see, in our pride, in our rebellion, we preferred death on the dock over the life we were made for in the water. And my point is simply this. That sin is not an alternative way to live. As if there's God's way and then there's my way. And those are just two different ways. And it would just be really better if God left me to live my way. But friends, there is no life outside of God. I do not get to tell God, I will live on my terms. I can die on my terms, but I can't live on them. Now, I realize you hear that, and, um, or if an unbeliever heard that, 
It would be easy to go, man, I just, I, that doesn't make any sense to me at all. I'm living my way on my own terms. I don't want anything to do with your God and check my pulse. Sure seems like I'm living, same as everybody else in this room, but they're not. They're dying. They're, they're moments away. And they don't even know how many moments left, but they're moments away from dying on the dock and being eternally separated from the life they were meant to live in the water. In contrast, a follower of Jesus is best defined as somebody who's no longer dying. And see, a Christian might go, well, I don't know, Josh, because, I mean, sure looks like I'm dying, right? Looks, looks to me like I'm headed toward the same end as the unbeliever, but you're not. You're not gonna die. You're gonna survive it. Jesus said, he who lives and believes in me will live, even though he dies. See, you're gonna pass through it like Jesus did, where then your death becomes no longer the final gasp before you're eternally on the dock. It becomes your final entrance into the water in which you were meant to live. So when John says in verse three, we know that we have come to know him if we keep his, demand, if we keep his commands. He is not saying that like it's a threat. He's not saying that life is what I earn, that the favor of God is what I earn by my obedience. Rather, he is saying that to obey is to live. It's not an if-then conditional statement. It's a matter of fact. If the fish is in the water, it will live. If it's on the dock, it won't. You want to live, in other words, according to John? Obey. And just what is it that God commands from you and me? An arbitrary list of house rules? An, an arbitrary list of just preferences for how to live? No, there's really just one command. Get off the dock. Live in the water in which you were created to live. The fact that you and I treat obedience to God, even as mature believers, as a burden is a reflection of how turned inside out we have become in our own sin. We have become like fish who are on the dock and imagine that if we're cast into the water, we would drown. We're that backwards that we think that obedience is now the burden that's put upon us. When in truth, the invitation to obey is the invitation to a fish to swim. I would imagine if creation could speak, it would say, guys, it's not nearly as hard as all of you are making it. Just live in accordance with how God created you to. The rest of us are doing it. Swim, live. You and I have so normalized our own sin that we don't even imagine or we can't even imagine what it would be like otherwise. And so going back to this sort of dichotomy between sort of the good cop who loves us and the bad cop who's saying, don't forget about the rules, we, we, we reduced the gospel. We reduced the gospel to just sort of like there's a, there's a, there's a police officer hiding behind the bend in the road to catch you and, oh, I got caught. And the fine is hell, but good news, like, this one has the Jesus card. Oh, never mind then, this one we actually love. You are free, sir, to go on speeding. You know the right code. No, that's not the gospel. The gospel is not the good news that now because of Jesus, you are free to stay on the dock. See, God's word holds. The rule remains. And the rule states, fish shall not live on the dock. And Jesus didn't abolish the rule. He says it explicitly. I did not come to abolish it, but to fulfill it. The problem, of course, and this is what most of the New Testament writers spend most of their time trying to unpack for us, specifically Paul, is that the problem is that the rule 
the law, is only ever that. It's a rule. Meaning, it is powerless to do anything other than tell you what the rule is. It is like a sign over the dock saying, fish shall not live on the dock. But it doesn't have any power to actually get the fish off the dock. And so it stands as just the the reminder of our own condemnation that we have violated the terms of our existence. But the gospel, the true gospel is the good news that in Jesus, God came onto the dock, that God came onto the dock and by the power of his own blood, he exchanged his life in the water for your death on the dock so that now he can look at you and me and say, follow me into the water. Follow me off the dock and I will immerse you. I will baptize you. I will plunge you into the water in which you were meant to live. John Bunyan, the writer of the Pilgrim's Progress, put it like this. He said, run, John, run the law commands, but gives us neither feet nor hands. Far better news the gospel brings. It bids us fly and gives us wings. And so then the question becomes, fun illustration aside, what does it mean to fly? What does that actually look like for you and me, right? If we're gonna define obedience as man acting in accordance with how God created him to live, then what was he created for? What is this life in the water? We're pretty familiar with life on the dock, our way. But what is the actual life in the water in which we were invited to live? And the answer that John is going to give again and again in his letters is love. John writes in 1 John 4, 16, God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. Translation, love is the water that you and I were meant to swim in, which should not surprise us because the very God who created us in his image is defined by John as a God who is love. To live, in other words, for John is to love. For John, he'll say this in chapter three, we'll get to this in the next couple of weeks, The the evidence that you are off the dock and into the water is love. He says, we know that we have passed from death to life because we love each other. Anyone who does not love remains in death. And who were you created to love? God. Think about how Jesus answered the question, what is the first and greatest commandment? And he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. How do I do that, God? How do I love God? By obedience to the second. Love your neighbor as yourself. Because as John is also going to write, whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. Love of God, love of neighbor. Jesus said all the law and the prophets hang on those two commandments. That's an incredible claim by Jesus. That's incredible. What it means is that every single one of God's rules, far from being arbitrary, were always oriented toward that one central end, love. Listen to how Paul puts it in Romans 13. He says those commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. He's quoting the 10 commandments. And then he says, and whatever other command there may be, every one of them, are summed up in this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. To live in the water is to live in the love of God. And that is expressed in how you and I love one another. Notice how that frames our entire understanding of disobedience. 
no longer as simply compliance or non-compliance with arbitrary rules that feel burdensome. Rather, sin is defined as that which is preventing you from living, which is that it is preventing you from love. The degree to which I am caught up in sin is the degree to which I am incapable of loving my neighbor. How so? Because it's hard to love my neighbor if I'm stealing from him. It's hard to love my sister if I'm envious of her. And don't think that private sins get us off the hook because it's like, well, I didn't really hurt my neighbor there. That's just what I did in the privacy of my own home. But see, that only assumes that you don't owe anything to your neighbor when Paul's gonna say there is one thing you owe. The only debt remaining is the debt to love one another. And see, if you're caught up in sin, then in a very real way, if all, your, if all your attention is turned in on self, even in the privacy of your own home, then really all you're doing is robbing your neighbor of the gift that was supposed to be you. There was something you were supposed to be doing, but you're not even thinking about your neighbor because it's all oriented this way. It's hard to love others if rather than seeing other people as the very people that I was created for, I'm looking at everyone as if they were created for me. And, and sizing everyone up by how much advantage can they be for me? How much of a burden is that one gonna be for me? And notice how the very filter of everything becomes just caved in on self. So even as I evaluate other people, it just becomes an evaluation of what's in it for me. So as odd as this might sound, the aim of the law, the aim of obedience is not simply that you and I would stop sinning. Rather, the aim of the law that Jesus says and that Paul expounds on in Romans is that you and I would love. That is, you and I would live in such a way that we put the interest of another above ourselves. The aim was love. The aim was always love. But get this, guess what happens if the aim of your obedience is love? You sin less. It gets thrown in. So going back to the beginning, the truth is there really is no distinction. There really is no need to pull these two things out like, oh, well, God loves me, but oh, well, he's really holy. He's got this really like tight house that he runs and like I'm not really clean enough. Don't make the mistake of dividing out the love of God and the holiness of God. R.C. Sproul wrote, whatever else God's love is, it is holy. See, it turns out that the love of God is a holy love. And here's what I mean by that, that the aim of holiness is love. Holy people love people. See, we get it backwards and we think that like, well, loving, those people that love people, like, man, they're really out there like loving people. But holy people are those who are like, man, I'm gonna keep my distance. I'm all like cleaned up. The definition of a holy person is not one who is just making the fewest mistakes. The definition of the most holy person is that they love others so much so that they end up making the fewest mistakes because it's a different interest that's in their mind. They're no longer operating for self. They're operating for the good of others. Loving God and loving other people. See, this is why it's a mistake to split it out. If you split it out, if you want to separate out the love of God and the holiness of God, there's two ways you could then make, there's two ways you can get it wrong. There's two ways we do get it wrong. The first one is the way of the, um, the way of the sort of modern progressive liberal, where you look at the conversation that John had with the steward and you go, John, we got good news for you. Forget the rule card. He loves you. 
And you don't have to worry about that. Throw the card out on your way out the door. See, we, if you make that mistake, you try to elevate the love of God by reducing the holiness of God, reducing obedience to God. But you can't make that mistake, friends. Because if you try to bypass obedience to get the love of God, you just end up inventing a God who affirms your life on the dock and you'll never get into the water. It's not love. It's not love to tell a fish you're good right where you're at on the dock. There's a better way. But there's an equal and opposite mistake you can make too. And this happens a lot. As a way to sort of clap back at those who might try to elevate the love of God at the expense of the holiness of God, others will try to elevate the holiness of God and snub their nose at the love of God as if it's just soft. I heard somebody say once, Jesus actually didn't preach a gospel of love. He preached a gospel of repentance. And everyone goes, ooh, that sounds holy. It's an utterly nonsensical thing to say because the only reason to preach a gospel of repentance is if you're appealing to people to turn from, but what is it that you're appealing to turn to? The appeal to repent is get off the dock. Why? For life in the water. If all you preach is a gospel of stop sinning, if, all your, if the aim of your obedience is simply that, if the aim of obedience is just obedience for, for its own sake, then two things will happen. Number one, you'll become a Pharisee. Number two, you won't stop sinning. Jesus defined the Pharisee as the one who, you sweep out your house, you sweep one demon out of your home, and all you do is make it a really great spot for seven more. When you try to just have a clean home, you just end up with one that's that much dirtier than it was before. The aim of our obedience is not a clean dock. That's the best the Pharisee has. Let's clean up this dock in which we're all dying. The aim of our obedience was the water. It's always been the water. And this is, we don't have time to unpack it. This would take an entire other sermon. But I'll just, I'll just add this thought. That if you look at the life of Jesus, take this for what you will. But when I read the life of Jesus in the Gospels, I notice something. He's, he's far more willing to be, he's far more willing if someone's going to get him wrong. He lives in such a way where he'd prefer that he's confused with sinners than he is for someone who won't go near them. In other words, no one ever accused Jesus of being too clean, but he absolutely got accused of being too dirty. If, if Jesus had to be confused by someone, he preferred that people confuse him with like, I'm a friend of sinners. And they did. Because in his pursuit, in his love for people, in his pursuit of sinners in their own sin, his desire for them, for them to know and experience the love of God, he was fine with the religious crowd thinking, maybe he's a sinner too, even though he wasn't. So if you go back to 1 John, chapter 2, 1 through 6, let's see if it doesn't, with this perspective on obedience, see if it doesn't come off the page a little bit different than if the steward had read it. My dear children, John writes, I am writing to you so that you may not sin. Friends, that is not a threat. That is not a bad cop. That is the greatest news you could ever hear. Dear friends, 
I am writing to you so that you may not die. I am writing to you so that you may get off the dock and into the life that you were created to live. We shouldn't just put the amen at the end of verse two. We should put it at the end of that sentence. Prior to Jesus, no one could write that. My dear friends, I'm writing to you so that you may not sin apart from Jesus. That's not an invitation. Can't do it without him. But if anyone does sin, verse two, that is, if any of you find yourself drifting back to the dock, anyone know what that feels like? Man, I've, I've experienced the water. Why am I drifting back to the dock? How did I end up back here? Then the, the beauty and assurance of verse 2 is that you have an advocate in Jesus Christ, which is to say you are free to jump back in. In fact, it's not a stretch to say that the entire Christian life is a life of continual practice, of jumping back in the water over and over and over again. The only way to do that is by faith. And what I mean by that is to jump back in is a decision to trust that I will deny what I think is right and I will choose to act instead in accordance with what God has said is true, even if it doesn't feel like it, even if it feels like I'm drowning. See, the world looks at the life that is offered to you and me and they think it looks like bondage. They think it looks like a burden. But it's faith that says the bondage was on this dock. The bondage was here, and I will trust life in the water. That's verse 3. John says in verse 3, we know that we have come to know him if we obey his commands. That is, my decision to trust God, that is, place my faith in God, is demonstrated by my obedience to him. And that's not always easy, friends. When everyone's on the dock, it's hard to jump in. The pursuit of holiness is not, is not an easy path. My friend Rosaria Butterfield put it like this, though, not one tear you shed in the struggle for holiness will be wasted. If you find yourself in the struggle, man, I keep climbing out of the water. Why do I keep doing that? Jump back in. Spend the rest of your life jumping back in. And yet, John says in verse 4, be careful. It's just a good pastor, not threatening, but cautioning. Be careful, he says, that you do not fall prey to any man who claims you can have it both ways. That you can live on the dock and have God. The truth is not in that person, he says. And if you and I do that, if we decide we will live life on our terms with me on the throne of it, where my decisions will be based on what's in my best interest and I don't get in the water, if I choose to live and follow the cravings of my own desires, presuming that God will bail me out on the last day, then I will die in my sin. And I will stand before Jesus Christ one day and he will tell me, I never knew you. The invitation was there. You never jumped. You never trusted. You never put your faith in me. Stayed on the dock. But if you turn and you follow Jesus into the water and you live that life of continual practice, of jumping in, learning how to swim. You will come to know God, according to John. And what you will discover is that God is what you wanted all along. The end of the pilgrim's regress, spoiler alert, but he wrote it over 100 years ago, so that's on you. Um, <clears throat> 
At the end of John leaves the steward's house and he goes in search of the island of his desire because he thinks he's seen in his head this vision of an island where it's like the life he wants and he just presumes it's the life where he gets to satisfy his desires. And so he goes and he finally arrives at the island of his desire and then he looks up and he realizes it was just the back of the mountain. He had just come in a full circle. Everything he thought he wanted he actually found it was there all along. So the book is called The Pilgrim's Regress because then the book is him going back and realizing like I, it was all there at the beginning. The landlord really did love me and what he was offering me was the life that I always wanted. I realize when we talk about the life that Jesus offers us, this invitation of life in the water, the invitation to love, to put to death your own desires and to pursue Christ instead. Especially in a culture like ours, it's not easy. But Jesus described the invitation of life in the kingdom, life in the water as treasure in a field. And he said, if you and I could see it, if you saw what God had in store, if you saw what life was like in the water, you would sell everything and you'd buy that field. You would buy that field because you'd see that the invitation into the water of God's love is not a life of starchy compliance with God's house rules. God does not will your harm. He wills your highest good. Your highest good. And his invitation is to satisfy every single desire of your heart. The life of love is the life you always wanted. And so my appeal to you is, if you're wondering where to start, pursue God. Pursue the knowledge of God revealed in Jesus Christ. Because if you pursue God, you will come to know him. And if you come to know him, you will come to love him. And you will start to experience the satisfaction of what you thought you needed to go on your own to try and satisfy. You will discover that to love is to live and the result, verse five and six, if anyone obeys his word, that is if anyone trusts, if anyone jumps in, God's love is truly made complete in him. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. Think about what that's saying. What happens if I pursue God, come to know God? I start to look like God. I start to look like Jesus lived. That's available to you and me. It's not a threat. It's the greatest news you could ever hear. You could look like Jesus. You could live in the water. You could experience it. And then one day, when you close your eyes in death, it won't be your defeat. It'll be your greatest triumph because it will be the moment that for the last time you plunge back into the water in which you were created to live, this time never to return to the dock because your faith will give way to sight and you will see what was always available to you in the water of God's love and you will never turn back from it again. Let's pray together. Oh, Father, I pray. that you would stir in our hearts tonight by the power of your spirit, a desire to know you. That Lord, where temptation would pull us away and where sin would drag us back in to just a short, miserable life with one little gasp that Lord instead you would show us more fully what is available to you what life in your kingdom looks like and God I pray that you would by the power of your spirit enable us by faith to jump
pray this in your holy name. Amen.
God of creation, there at the start, before the beginning of time. With no point of reference, he spoke to the dark and fleshed out the wonder of life. As you speak, a hundred billion galaxies are born, in the vapor of your breath, the planets form. If the stars are made to worship, so will I. I can see your heart in it. I know for one thing, it is to obey the Lord, to gather together in his beauty, to declare the mystery of the gospel, that we can be alive in him. So we sing. If the stars were made to worship so, obey him tonight.
Hey, let's pray together. Father, I know in this room tonight that there are men and women in here who are jammed up in patterns of sin that pull them down, deflate them. And I know the voice of the enemy speaks and tells them, this is who you are. There's no other way. And so God, I pray that on this campus tonight that you would give us assurance that the love of God meets us even in our deepest sin and that you invite us to plunge in to the ocean of your love. But God, what I especially pray tonight is that in this room, the legacy of the lives of the men and women here will not be simply that whatever has them jammed up, that their legacy wouldn't be, oh, I stopped that. That it would be more than just, I stopped doing that thing. God, I pray that the legacy of the people in this room would be people. I pray that you would give us victory over the sin that so easily entangles us so that, Lord, we could more readily live like you lived and lay down our lives for the people around us. And so I pray that the legacy of the men and women in this room would be people that when we die and go to see you, that behind us there would be Stories of stories of people who what they would remember us as is, that person loved me. That person came after me. That person pursued me. God, I pray that our legacy would be love, that our legacy would be that we would love others like you loved us, and in loving others that we would more readily point others to you. I pray that in your holy name. Amen. God loves you, now love. Amen. You guys are dismissed.